So uh, yeah, welcome to my first talk at the React Vienna. I'm a long time lurker and I actually never did a talk, but now uh, it's finally time to do so. By the way, notice that the, the, I, I got the prompt exactly right to, to have this nice, you know, we are in Dynatrace in the tower and then there's this React logo. So yeah, quite proud of that one. But you know, starting off this talk, um, I want to take you on a journey to the past actually. Uh, imagine the year 2014, and that's already like 10 years ago, it's uh, quite a long time. And the world was actually a different place back then, because back then we didn't have ES6, we didn't have promises, we didn't have map, we didn't have for each, we didn't have spread operators, we, so many nice things we didn't have, right? And people used Lodash to, to, uh, to have all of that functionality. And we needed polyfills to do most of the stuff we wanted to use uh, from the language, right? Um, but 2014 was also the year where Backbone.js was still a thing. Who of you know Backbone.js? Uh, and also PHP was kind of the, <laughs> the <laughs> default way <laughs> to, <laughs> to do front-end engineering, right? So yeah, but you know, 2000, 2014 was also the year where Leonardo DiCaprio still didn't win an Oscar. <laughs> so yeah, sad for him, I guess. But um, you know, maybe you guessed it, 2014 was uh, also the year where Facebook uh, decided to grace the world with React.js, right? Um, and it would disrupt the web community, it would change how we write uh, user interfaces. And back then, I was, I was really obsessed with React, uh, and, but not only with React in general, but uh, also with, with web technology in general, or with tech in general. And I also assumed that other people are as into tech as I am, um, and actually use it to its full extent. Um, but turns out, that's absolutely not how humans work. Uh, we are creatures, creatures of habit, and we usually go the path of least resistance, right? I mean, even I do that, um, but curiously enough, not with tech. And so maybe this is my hidden superpower, or it's just my ADHD, who knows? Um, but I tell you a small story. Um, I was an Android user for the most part of my life. And uh, two years ago, I switched to iOS, and it only took like two weeks until mm, my colleagues would say, oh, I can do that with iPhone. Oh, that's possible on my phone. Uh, and so, yeah, I thought I'd leverage this power and get you out of the path, path of least resistance and make our lives as devs easier. So this is kind of the aim of this talk. Uh, but before I do that, um, yeah, let me take you even more down the memory lane. Um, who remembers this guy? <laughs> it's quite a long time ago, right? Uh, it was a time where we used to write React like this. We had, yeah, we, we really used require in, in the browser or in browser code. And also there was this create class function, which was used to create React components. Also, you might notice the module exports, which was totally a thing back then. We, we had those old style exports. And how did these uh, components look like? Actually, in my opinion, it's quite refreshing because it's quite simple. Uh, you could use an uh, initial state function. You know, you had your, your, your handlers, which could set the state. And then also, um, you just rendered your, your component and you could just pass everything and it's super easy. All was good, uh, you know, until people used React not only for small hobby projects, <coughs> but uh, write, wrote prod, prod, uh, prod apps with it and ran into problems. And the big question back then was, how do we share functionality? And who of you know how we did that back then? Yeah, of course, it was mixins. And um, how did they look? Actually, super simple. It was just you know a basic object where you could define your function. You could have your lifecycle methods. I won't go into lifecycle methods this talk. And if you wanted to use them, it's actually quite easy. On top, you just define 
mixins and you pass it as an array and you can have as many mixins as you want. And if you do that, you can just use it like this. You just say this log and you can uh, use the functionality you just mixed in into your component, right? But, you know, there was this one problem, right? So if you used multiple mixins, then you know you might have your own mixin which does some logging, and then you implicitly used some mixin from uh, a third-party library, and I think you get the gist, right? So <laughs> it led to obscure bugs, and things were overriding each other, and basically there was no, there was almost nothing you could do about it. But anyways, that's the past. That's how we wrote React components in the old days. Um, you know, the React community was a, was a happy community. Time went on, and then something happened. This guy came around. It was actually pretty cool, because it gave us promises, which we could use, uh, use natively in the browser without having to use any like, third-party promise library. We got let, we got const, uh, we got generators. Anybody uses that, them? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, not so many people, but it's sad. Um, we got arrow functions, which is totally a thing. I couldn't like imagine JavaScript anymore without those. Um, we got string interpolation, we got the spread operator, uh, we got the classes, we got the classes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so if we have classes, what can we do with classes? We can extend classes, right? So, yeah, Facebook tried to be very hip back then, and they said, oh, that's so cool. We have classes now in JavaScript. What did they do? Um, they gave us this. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't know. It's in the eye of the beholder if that's a good idea or if it was a good decision. But, you know, back then, when we wanted to write components, it actually... <laughs> It, it immediately looks more, more complicated, right? Because now you have this constructor, and then you have to actually call super, which is super annoying, pun intended. And if you didn't do it, you got a lot of like obscure bugs, and it was, yeah, I don't know. And then you could, of course, set the initial state. And then you had to, you had to do this dance all the time. Like, you had to bind the this to the function, because when you pass the function to a click handler, it would lose the context and it was super complicated. And after you did all of this, you could finally pass the thing to, to the click handler. So I don't know if you remember, but for me, this was always <laughs> very, very cumbersome to do this actually. So yeah, this is how, how components looked back then. Um, and of course, you could also do lifecycle methods, but again, I won't go into those. And there's this question again. How do we share functionality? What's the answer to this que question? Hox. And no, I didn't mesh my head onto the keyboard. It's actually high order components, right? So um, yeah, uh, it's actually funny because high order components are uh, considered a very functional approach, actually. Uh, and React back then relied a lot on classes, which is the OOP version uh, of programming. So that was quite curious. I think React was in a, had a kind of a identity crisis or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, let's go on. Um, how did uh, a high order component look like? Um, it is actually just a function which takes a component. Uh, you can you know, define your custom functionality. You can have your uh, your life cycle methods mm -hmm. and then you had to do this you had to render the component which was passed into your function then pass it all the props that came with the component and then additionally pass your own props into the component and so yeah it was quite complicated i mean i let you be the judge if it's easier to just create an object or to do this but anyways um, if you wanted to use a high order component back then, um, you had to write this thing where you just say, hey, with logging, and then you wrapped your component, and then you could just use the custom functionality via accessing the props, right? So yeah, that's how uh, in that area we used to write React components. And now you might ask, 
What do I do if I want to use multiple higher order components? Well, um, uh, yeah, so either you do this abomination, right? You, you just wrap uh, the higher order component with the higher order component with the higher order component. But it was actually back then when I learned about the, the compose function, which makes it a little bit nicer, but still, you know, it's. Uh, you have this on, on the bottom of your, of your component, and keeping track of this was not very easy, so to speak. But you know, um, the React team was aware of those problems, of course, and uh, React 16.8 brought us <laughs> hooks, right? I, I love those animations, can you tell? Um, yeah, so our Lord and Savior hooks, right? They will solve everything, right? They're super easy to use, right? They're super intuitive to use, right? <coughs> Easier than life cycle methods, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I let you be the judge of that, but um, it's actually crazy because React version 16, or this version at least, was released almost four years ago. And so not a lot of versions have been published since then. So now we are on 18.2 or something like that. I'm not sure. But yeah, speaking of hooks, we all, we all love it, right? <laughs> Use effect. It's the most beautiful hook we have. Um, you know, we have, we have effects. And with effects and other hooks also come dependency arrays. And we all love dependency arrays, right? So. You never know if, am I stable? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? You're using something from a third party hook. You can never be sure. People had to uh, actually then learn about this is not the same. I mean, it's very basic stuff, but you know, complex objects uh, and referential equality. And then, you know, to know what is a stable function, what does it mean? You know, it was ah, great times, you know? Uh, and then also, you know, if you use, use callback or use memo, you have a dependency in there and it might be stable or no, it might be an evil dependency, who knows. Um, yeah, and show of hands, the number of debugging sessions because you had some unstable uh, dependency, right? I, I, I've done this so many times where something re-renders and you just what the hell is going on and you, you, you go on a search and then it's some third party dependency or something. So I, I, I asked Dolly to create this, this art of re-rendering React and re-render cycles and I think it, uh, it, it really turned out quite well. And so, yeah, doing all of this stuff, I'm like, this is fine, <laughs> right? So, but actually, the, the title of my talk is called Fun React Hooks You Might Not Use, right? So, and this guy is like going on about this past stuff. But you know, I, I think it was important to, to, to tell you how this leads up to and what I've been, you know, doing in, the, in my past uh, career. And so, yeah, I, I've lived through all of the phases of React, so to speak, and now we have hooks. And um, I think there is ways where we can make our lives easier. And there, right now, React has uh, released a few really cool hooks. And um, just to mention a few, uh, I have looked at the Google Trends. So um, there is use sync external store, use transition, use ID, use deferred value, just to name a few. I think in, in Trends you cannot have more than four. And actually. This one is where it got released, so I don't know what this is, but uh, <laughs> this is the, the re release date, right? Um, and so if you compare that with uh, use effect, it's like it's here, right? <laughs> so not a lot of people are actually searching for those hooks. And so, you know, I thought maybe uh, I'd encourage you to, to use some of them because some of them are like really, really handy and really cool. Um, and so there's also an honorable mention. We have use reducer, and it's somewhere around here. And so I thought I'd also put that into the mix because in, I feel that a lot of people are afraid of use reducer for some reason and rather use 10 million use dates instead of use reducer. So yeah, I thought I, I also take a look at this hook. 
And so the first one, um, yeah, I want to do like a little game because I'm, I'm interested in, in your experience. Uh, I want like a, a quick show of hands. Um, who of you knows this hook? And who of you has already used this hook in production? Okay, that's interesting because actually um, I've seen a lot of production code like this where, you know, um, there is some generate ID stuff and then it's like math random and some string shenanigans and substring. And so, yeah, then people are putting that into some state and then you have, you know, your, your, your password hint ID and you put that there. And actually, yeah, it's, it's quite messy because there is a far easier way. You just import use ID, you just use the hook and then you get a password hint ID, which you can then use in your components and it's super easy. And it also actually works on server-side rendering with React server components, um, which is pretty neat to know in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, very nice hook and uh, maybe you can use that in the future. Also, now we have use reducer. Who of you knows this hook? Yeah, that's like a little bit more, I think. And who has used this hook already? Yeah, and who is afraid of this hook? <laughs> oh yeah, that sounds also like a few. Um, because actually, um, I th my theory is that when people hear use reducer, they are thinking about Redux, and I have to admit, this sound it, it, it sounds scary, right? But actually, you can do cool stuff with reduce, use reducer. And uh, the synopsis is like, it's very easy to, uh, to use. You just pass it a reducer function and some initial state, and you're good to go. But you might ask, how does this reducer function look like? Um, actually, it's very easy because the function receives the current state and an action. And it's basically a very big switch statement, which can switch the action type and then you can do cool stuff like this where you can have a reset action to reset your state or you do some complex state computations and then you return the new newly generated state and to put this into perspective I'm very sorry for very small code this time but <laughs> a lot of times in in my career I have seen react components like this and I think you have too uh, we have around seven, eight-ish uh, use state uh, functions which are used for all the, the, the form fields. And then there's also this notorious reset state function where, of course, we always forget to reset this one state and then we have this bug ticket and we have to, we have to do this again. And also very complicated state handlers and it clogs up our components and, you know, it just could look like this. You just use the use reducer function and then you just dispatch uh, your, your, your actions and it really cleans up your component. And I think it really pays out to, to look more into the, the use reducer because it really can tidy up your code and make it more readable for, for, uh, for future code readers. So as I already said, you know, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I kind of fucked this up a little bit. Um, yeah, but anyways, this, this is how it looks, right? So, which leads me to the next hook, actually, um, which is called use sync external store. What a mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. So, who of you knows this hook? And who of you has used this hook already? Okay, that's <laughs> very little. So, I think this, this is one of the hooks you did not know you need it uh, because it's actually really cool. Um, it's also very easy to use. You just um, pass it two things, two functions actually. The first function is uh, get snapshot and the second function is the subscribe function. And now you might ask why do I need this and how does this look like? Um, we have the get snapshot function which just returns any piece of state which has to be stable, that's important. And we also have a subscribe function, which um, you can subscribe to some events 
and you also have a cleanup function. But why should you use this? In this very example, I've used Navigator Online, which tells you if the browser is connected to the internet or no. So you could have a chat indicator, for instance, and you just do this, and it's the easiest way to display an online status to your app, actually. Um, and you could also use this for uh, you could also use this for WebSocket uh, state, and if the WebSocket is still connected, anything like that, I think it's pretty handy, and it's another way to avoid use effect. Great, isn't it? So, yeah, great. Um, and you can also show off to your colleagues that you know this hook because it's like it's very. You have a question. Was a subscriber at the end on the slide before? Uh, you mean, oh, what? What do you want uh, to? So one slide earlier. One slide earlier. It was this one? No. Oh, like one? Yeah. Yeah? Should, should, and then subscribe, and now you're just the other way around. Oh, really? Then uh, <laughs> it might be an error. No. Because I know that the first thing is, uh, yeah, this is, OK, good, good. Uh, it, it's actually the other way around. Okay. You're, you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, then React 18 came, and what did React 18 finally bring us? Of course, it's concurrent mode. And who of you knows what concurrent mode is? So, okay, I might uh, explain this a little bit more. It's also known as non-urgent updates. So currently in React 17 and below, uh, every update is urgent. And so there is no way of telling React that it can do render work in the background. And with concurrent mode, uh, there is actually now we have an API or a way where we can tell React, hey, this update is not so urgent. You can do this in the background and defer the rendering a little bit. And it can also be canceled if you are moving away from the, from the current page or something. But there's a very, very nice talk of Ivan. And it was at the React Summit. And don't worry, at the end, I have some resources where you can watch this talk. And it's, I, I highly recommend it, because it's a really, really nice talk of Ivan. And yeah, it's basically the, the concurrent mode comes with a, an API with two hooks. And I quickly want to go over them. So the first hook is use transition. And quick show of hands, who knows this hook? And also, who has used this hook already? OK, so it's also very little. Um, it's a really cool hook, actually, because it's very easy to use. And um, you just use it, and you get two things. You get an is pending and a start transition function. So how does this look like? I'm going to show you first a very simple example where you can kind of uh, misuse this hook a little bit to get to know it a little better. So let's say we have a search results component, and we have some update query function. And all, of the, all what this function does is it sets the query, and it also starts a transition, which then does some async work. And at the end, we set the results. And the only thing we are telling React is, hey, the query state or the query piece of state is an important update. because. When you're typing, you want to have immediate feedback what you're typing. But anything else, like all of the other stuff and all of the other state that comes afterwards, is non-important. And this is marked by this, uh, by this start transition. And what this gives you is a very nice way of um, telling the app that something is pending. And you can use this as a very easy way to avoid use effect again and have uh, start transition when you do web requests. And it looks like this in total. Um, but you know, actually, if you are doing web requests, you should probably use some fetch caching library anyways, like 10 stack query or SWR. Uh, so, but now I'm going to show you a better use case for this, for this hook, which actually is pretty cool. So consider this app. Uh, or consider this, this scenario. And actually, we had this at work. 
Um, so that's why I, I chose to, uh, to show you this example where we had a very uh, render intensive table component, right? And we also have some tabs. And what happened, so you can see the spinner stops because it's, it takes a very long time to render this. And it's not a very nice user experience when you try to click stuff and the app just hangs. So, of course, you can always optimize the components so this doesn't happen. Or you can also use stuff like use debounce, use memo, and so on. But in this case, React gave us just one more tool to cope with such situations because sometimes <laughs> you're importing the table from a third party component library or something, and there's very little you can do to increase the performance, right? So, what if I told you that with start transition, you can have a user experience which looks like this? So, it's actually very nice. It's uh, reacting immediately, and also in the background, React is cancelling the render of the table um, if if it can't find, uh, or if, it, if you change the tab again. So in my opinion, it's always good to give people or your users immediate feedback and uh, show them what is happening because when you click and nothing is happening, users don't know what happens and they click multiple times, which then starts multiple render cycles, which is not good for performance. So yeah, how does this look like? Um, it's actually not very hard to do. Consider this, we have a piece of state which is storing the current tab and then we have a few tab, uh, tab buttons which are doing nothing else than setting the state, right? So the tab button is doing nothing else than calling the set tab function. And then of course we have a very simple implementation of React Router or something like that. No, it's, it's of course not, but uh, it's, it's showing the tab which is currently active. And then how does this tab button look like? It's actually using use transition. And you call this use transition hook and the only thing you have to do to make this work is to wrap the function that is changing your state inside the start transition. And if you remember from before, the only thing we did in the callback, in the button callback, is set tab. So the tab state is changing our app and by telling React that this is a non-urgent update, we actually manage, uh, so React can render this in the background and if we are switching the tabs very quickly, then um, we get better performance. And I think this is a very handy trick uh, if you have third party components which might not be that performant and if you are willing to jump through a few hoops to, to use this hook. And lastly, there is use deferred value, which is actually the same as use transition, but it's more, e it's even easier to use this because the only thing you need for use deferred value is to pass it a value. So you might ask, how does this look like again? Um, and it's actually very easy. So if you don't have an imperative function, which you can call in start transition. And if you only have some state, which is causing the app to render very, not uh, where the performance is very bad, then you can just wrap it into use deferred value. And React will know that if this state is changing, anything that is affecting is not important. So it will do it in the background. And so actually I also uh, joined this example from the, from the React devs, which are pretty good. Um, so you see you're typing and nothing is happening and you know, suddenly something appears on the screen and it's not very nice user experience. So how could this look like? If you use the, trend, the, the use deferred value, you can spam and React knows because we have two pieces of state. The, the first piece of state is actually the, the input value and then the deferred value we are using to show this in the, very, uh, in, the, in the component which is not performing well. So React can say, okay, this piece of state is important and the other is not. And so it can do this in the background. So what is the gist of this talk, right? 
First, nobody likes use effect and dependency arrays, right? Use ID is a neat little trick. Don't be scared by use reducer. You didn't know you needed use sync external store. <laughs> and finally, concurrent rendering is cool. But you know, there is no free lunch. So if you're using concurrent mode, it will make it so the, the components take a little bit longer to render. But you know, the user experience is better. So you can decide if you want to use this or not. So finally, Thanks for listening to my presentation. And I have a little page where I collected all of the information I used to do to, to this talk. So you can download and see the, see the slides afterwards. Questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't I'm not out yet. yet. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, with the use sync external store. Yeah. What would be the what would come from the callback in the? So it's actually uh, let me how do I do this? Function. Yeah, the subscribe. It's it's a very simple hook actually. Um, so let me do this again. So the callback <laughs> is just a void function, and if you call it then React will re-render, and by re-rendering, it will take the get snapshot again. So anytime you are calling the callback in any form, it will just re-render the component, which then leads to the state being asked again. Yeah. Did this answer your question? Yeah, so, so it's like you, you don't have to define anything. Just yes. So that subscribe knows when it's yeah. get. It's basically the, the callback function is a hey react render this component and <coughs> it will re-render. Yeah. So you don't have to pass any state or anything, it's just a void function. Yeah. Yes? You said that the get snapshot function should be stable. What does this mean? Wh what so function? You said that the get snapshot function should be stable. So uh, not not the function itself, but the, the result should be stable and it should have the same reference all the time. So if you are creating a new object here and you're returning that, you will have an infinite re-render cycle because you're creating an object every time and React is just comparing the references, which then is different all the dependency arrays. You know, we all love it, right? <coughs> so yeah, this is a very big caveat. You have to use some value that is either a simple value like number, string, boolean, or you have a stable, uh, stable value you pass back there. Yes? This is exactly my pain point. Or one of, I, I use, I, I make uh, use of this hook a lot, but this is like creating stable references to external stores that don't have stable yeah. references is um, a yeah. freaking pain. Yeah. Um, have you ever, like, basically what I do is I, I create now custom caches and I yeah. make helper functions to do that. Yeah. But it's, 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 no, it's it feels terrible. Yeah. A better solution. Yeah, maybe if I come up with one, I'll, I'll ping you. <laughs> Perfect. You have but my yeah. email. But <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe the new cache function from React or something. All right. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> but I don't know if it's, is the new cache function stable already in the? No idea. Okay. I don't, I don't it's know. very bleeding edge. <laughs> yeah. okay. well, what? Well, I haven't read about this. But yeah. What is the new cache function? So you can give it a function and it will look at the input parameters and it will create a small cache for for your for your function so um, if you maybe have a function that gets you some user by id and you pass the same id all the time to this function which is cached then you will always get the same result and it doesn't work like use memo where it always um, where it only caches the last result and if you have some result from before, it has to recalculate it, which in my mind didn't make a lot of sense, but it's actually like it, this works. And the cache function stores the cache for longer. But the, oh, oh. that's the question. Okay. And the React documentation also doesn't say, and I think the React team is not so sure about this either. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is it part of the core? Yeah, it is. It's, it will come, I think, with the use hook, and yeah. it's also, it sense, yeah. yeah. It's, it's in the canaries that next yeah. uses 
Really? Yeah. Which you can npm install and uh, yeah. add the type gems for them. Yeah. You probably should. So yeah, you probably should. should. Yeah. <laughs> but do you know how long it caches it? So for Next.js, it's used for request debugging inside the same request cycle. Yeah. So I'm assuming for not long. Yeah. So okay. it's used for the same request right now. Wow. So it's like in memory, so probably forever, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Memory leaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, yeah. Now we, we learned all the rules of React hooks, and now we get the new hook called use, which defies all of the rules. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, future talk. <laughs> Any, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Look, to me, this really feels like uh, if I have a team of developers and, and I now start to flex uh, among them with these cool new hooks, it feels like introducing new uh, language features of Java in the team that is not used to it. So <laughs> how would you recommend slowly introducing these new concepts to them, aside from giving a talk and getting <laughs> Yeah, you know, you just give a talk and then no. <laughs> no. Um, so I tried to do this already in the company by doing an internal knowledge talk. And, um, you know, I'm also very passionate about React stuff and I often nerd out about this stuff with colleagues. So I think this is a good way of, of uh, in, my, in my team actually, I talked about those hooks and they were immediately like, oh, this could solve those problems we have right now. And then we experimented a little bit and it worked out and it was pretty cool. So yeah, I think this is the way to go, to just talk about it and get people hyped, out of, uh, hyped about it and get people out of the path of least resistance, right? Because we are all used to eff effect and state and nothing else. And yeah, we have so much more. So it sounds like you didn't get any angry comments on your PR. No, I didn't. <laughs> you get, it looks good to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 not even that. This was just LGTM. Yeah. 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 Approved. <laughs> Needs work. <laughs> um, I just checked the React docs about the caching. Yeah. The cache function. It says React will invalidate the cache for all members functions for each server request, and it's only intended for server components. Right. Ah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. The more you know. It doesn't solve my problem on the client. Yeah, though. that's true. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Back Thanks for looking it up, though. Yeah. Back to building caches myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, then uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you.